okay, let's begin. Um, I want to welcome you all to this particular uh, forum. My name is uh, Anthony Bogues. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice, and a professor in, Af in Africana Studies. This particular forum is titled The Global Explorations of Human Trafficking, Race, and Labor. The Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice, we, some of you will remember, emerged out of a set of reports that the university did a couple of years ago uh, on slavery and justice and the links of this university to the Atlantic uh, slave trade. Uh, the center is three years old. Uh, we are just across the road, for those of you who want to uh, go over and see what we look like uh, physically. Uh, the center has uh, <clears throat> now operates as a unit in the university with a different set of research clusters, uh, one on glo a global project on slavery, uh, another one on thinking about slavery and the contemporary world and its emergence, and uh, one on uh, the business of the legacies of slavery in the United States. One of our other cluster is, uh, is, re is the called Human Trafficking Today. And uh, we are very fortunate to have leading that cluster a faculty who joined us a year or so ago, uh, John Brown, uh, Professor uh, Elena Shee. What we did l last year or was that we appointed Elena and um, then said to her, just uh, get together with some students, um, develop a program that we think is important that can become a very important research cluster at Brown, but also nationally. And she has begun that work. So I'm really very happy um, that she has joined the, fellow, the, joined the center as a faculty fellow, and she's working with a group of students, some of whom are here to talk about their work today. Elena is an is assistant professor of American Studies and Ethnic Studies at Brown and is a former postdoctoral post fellow at the Watson Institute of uh, International Studies. Her first book, The Price of Freedom, Moral and Political Eco Economies of Global Human Trafficking Rescue is based on 40 months of ethnographic uh, participant observation on the transnational movement to combat human trafficking in China, Thailand, and the United States. So this is really, I think this is really her key work. She is an amazing scholar. She's also a really great teacher. And as, as a faculty fellow, we at the center look forward to her developing this cluster. She will introduce the students and the work, Elena. Thank you, Tony, and thank you all for being here this morning. Um, I'm really, really excited about this brand new program, and as somebody who's new to Brown, in my first year, I had the opportunity to teach a qualitative methods course for junior uh, development studies concentrators, and it was through that course that I met Eve and Reem. We learned a whole set of qualitative research methods and prepared an elaborate strategy for them to go out this summer and do really, really impressive research projects, which they will be telling you about now. Um, without further ado, I'll first introduce Eve. Eve is a senior Africana studies concentrator who received a summer UTRA, that's an undergrad teaching and research assistantship fellowship that's available to all undergrads, from the CSSJ to study human trafficking in Brazil. Eve's research centers on the intersections of race and human trafficking and uses Brazil as a point of study because of its long history of forced labor. With the support of the CSSJ UTRA, Eve had the opportunity to explore the relationship between colonial slavery and modern forced labor in Brazil. Her research focused on government policy, anti-trafficking NGOs, uh, and discourse in the media. She's particularly interested in changing, and di changing diverse definitions of human trafficking and forced labor. So without further ado, I'll invite Eve up to the stage. So um, 
as Elena just said, I received an UCHA this summer from the Center for the, Slavery, uh, for Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice uh, to do a research project on human trafficking in Brazil, which I called From Slavery to Human Trafficking, for Slavery in Brazil. So my main research question is, how does the legacy of slavery in Brazil influence the way that politicians, NGOs, academia, and the media define human trafficking? So just to give some historical background, um, Brazil had an extremely large amount of enslaved Africans. Uh, 4.5 million Africans were sent to Brazil as slaves, uh, which is more than any other country in the Americas. And um, in addition to that, 21.4% of Brazil's inhabitants live below the poverty line. So there's a lot of poverty in Brazil, and it's very racialized poverty. Um, so given the history of slavery in Brazil, what are those current legacies, and how are those affecting human trafficking? And what does human trafficking even mean is really the focus of my project because, as I saw, there are so many different definitions and what is the difference between human trafficking and forced labor? Um, and how is this affected by like, race and all those things? So some of the major forms of forced labor that, came, that I was looking at were agricultural labor, um, being people working at plantations, often in very rural areas. Um, that were brought there usually by will, but once they got there, uh, it was very difficult to leave or they were exploited long hours. They didn't necessarily even know where they were. Um, another aspect is urban construction work. So people working in cities like Rio or Sao Paulo and uh, working in the construction business, but were like not with proper workers' rights, um, not able to advocate for themselves, uh, usually because they are living in really terrible conditions and aren't even aware of their rights necessarily. Um, the third one is factory labor, which is commonly done by immigrants uh, from other areas in Latin America or even from uh, Haiti or around the world. Um, so things that people are vulnerable to are debt bondage, which is most common in plantations. Uh, so that would be you going to work somewhere and then your employer telling you that you owe a certain amount of money and that you're constantly working off that debt. And that no matter what you do, you always have that debt hanging over you. So it functions kind of on this sense of like responsibility um, and that you're owing someone something. And so it becomes very hard to escape. Um, so exploitation being that like overall these workers are being taken advantage of. Um, and then for immigrants, uh, documents are a big issue because their employers might withhold their documents so they can't <coughs> escape, or if they came, if they immigrated without um, official documents, then they might be vulnerable to being deported. Um, so this picture illustrates workers at a sugar plantation, and this was taken in 2010. Um, and what I find so surprising about this is that it looks like it could have been taken maybe like 100 years ago or more. Um, and then this is a worker, I think, at a um, wood, like cutting wood or something. And it says slave labor. Um, I thought this time passed in Portuguese. Um, and then this is showing the where people are vulnerable to what they call like modern slavery, uh, which is also like an interesting term. Uh, and it's mostly in rural areas. So you have like the Amazon and um, Northeast Brazil, which is pr predominantly poor and predominantly black. Uh, and also one of the things that came up with studying agricultural labor is the way that there's many intersections between um, like environmental destruction and forced labor. So like people working on deforestation projects and like doing illegal, like the workers are there illegally, but are, are being treated in a way that's illegal. And also the projects are often illegal. Um, so some of the key lenses I was using to look at human trafficking are race, gender, poverty, and migration. And my method, so when I, so I went to Rio for um, five weeks, and I was doing ethnographic field work there, mostly based on interviews. Um, so I interviewed people that work at NGOs and people that were involved with human trafficking. Um, and I, didn't, I wasn't able to talk to anyone that was trafficked or was forced into a bad situation, but I was able to talk to people that were working to help those people. Um, and then I also did lots of observations. Um, I was able to attend a conference on human trafficking. Um, yeah. 
And so speaking of that conference, uh, this was particularly interesting because the conference was called uh, Justice and Citizenship in Defense of Threatened Life, uh, Combating Human Trafficking. And it was, it was run by the government. It was at the Cultural Cent or the Center for Federal Justice. And um, they gave me a fancy certificate saying I participated and had all this stuff printed out. But really, they, talked, they barely talked at all about what was actually happening in human trafficking, how they even were defining it. And it was very centered on the witness protection program. Um, so, so yeah, so what they wrote as the three main forms of human trafficking were uh, sexual exploitation, labor exploitation, and then removal of organs. Um, and this, the project I'm doing actually does not focus very much on sexual exploitation because that is like commonly what people think of when they think of human trafficking, but really like in Brazil and in other places, labor is a much bigger issue. Um, so it, just to like give it a different, to kind of approach it from a different angle. Um, and so some of the things that came up in my research were I went to one organization that uh, has the goal of providing legal aid to people that have been trafficked. And I was talking with them, and I asked them, how do you define human trafficking? What does it mean in the context of, sla in, of colonial slavery? And all they could talk about was soccer and the way that people were often trafficked through soccer teams and sent abroad. Brazilian men were being sent abroad to play on foreign soccer teams and were being exploited. Um, which was really concerning considering that this was a very, this was like one of the few organizations that spoke, focused specifically on human trafficking uh, and that their main focus would be on soccer and they gave me a fancy brochure like illustrated with lots of different things but that seems like very far from what the real form, I mean this might be a real thing but just like what the major forms of human trafficking are. I don't believe that soccer players is one of them. Um, so, and then another thing that came up is the issue of uh, domestic labor, because in Brazil they have a lot of um, like house workers that are generally women that will clean houses or cook in houses and sometimes they'll even live there. And one person who runs an organization for black women that did a project on human trafficking um, was talking about the way that people working inside houses is, like these women working inside houses is actually a form of forced labor, uh, which is a very controversial thing to say because those women are often choosing to work there and yes, they might be, they might not have like access to many other different types of jobs, but is it necessarily forced labor? Uh, but that was interesting to me because the reason she was saying that is that that was a common, like having people live inside the house was something that obviously happened during slavery. So she was drawing that connection um, that was less focused on your rights, but more focused on the act, like that act of like having someone in the house and seeing that as uh, slavery. Um, and then the other thing that was particularly interesting is um, telenovelas. So there was, so one of the biggest uh, broadcasting networks in Brazil is called Hedgy Global and they put on a telenovela that was related to human trafficking and it was about um, people, it was, I think the central character was being trafficked. Uh, so that was actually a lot of people's like introduction to human trafficking uh, and I was able to talk to an NGO that worked with this, with, that, with the broadcasting network and they had set up a hotline that like would show up on the screen after the telenovela aired and they created a whole program online that was about uh, human trafficking in relation to the telenovela. And I was talking to them and I asked them, so like what's that show ended, like what's happening now? And they said, oh, as soon as the show ended, we took down the hotline, like we're, we took down the website, it's, that's not really a thing anymore. Uh, so I thought that was very interesting because it was, it was also connected to probably the money they were receiving from this network and that their interest really died out once that network stopped putting on this TV show. Um, so yes, yeah, so I really saw a huge variety in the types of projects NGOs were putting on and in the way that they were even conceptualizing of human trafficking and labor rights. Um, 
And so some of the future directions that I that came up, because this really, instead of you know, coming back with answers, I came back with a lot more questions, <laughs> um, are like, what are their sources of funding? So how are the sources, how is the money they're getting affecting what they're choosing to study, the way they're framing it? Um, another big issue is that a lot of people just simply said they don't even have enough research on this to, to speak that much. Like a lot of people were like, like I'm just going to tell you my personal opinion because I don't know the numbers. I don't have access to numbers. I don't even know if this research is being done. Uh, so what is the actual commitment to trafficking that uh, Brazilian society has or that NGOs have that isn't just you know, creating a small program in a big human rights NGO that like, might do a, a project from time to time but doesn't really know much about what they're talking about? Because that was really the main thing I noticed is that even these people that said they're focusing on it weren't really focusing on it. They were doing many other things, but not really trafficking. Um, and so also, how do we bring race into this discussion? Because it's often left out, and the role of race is extremely unclear. Um, it's Everyone had a very different impression of the way race affected uh, human trafficking discourse. Um, and so also, my final question is really, what are the implications of these various definitions? Like, what does it matter that people are defining human trafficking so differently? Uh, how does it affect like policy changes and uh, the way that the public is like responding to uh, human rights violations? So. Uh, thanks, Eve. Next up, it's my pleasure to introduce Reem Brooks. Reem's passions are driven by prison abolitionists and queer black radical feminists in her life. Most of her recent time has been spent with space in prisons for the arts and creative expression, students against the prison industrial complex, the Blue Stockings Magazine, Ad Astra Comics, and the Direct Action for Rights and Equalities Black Studies Advisory Board. She is a senior concentrator in development studies. Join me in welcoming Reem. Hi. I tend to mumble when I give presentations, so if you could just raise your hand if I'm mumbling, that'd be really great. Okay. Um, so I wanted to give a bit of background about why I was doing this project and why um, I found this topic interesting, um, and then talk a bit about the research that I did this past summer and have been doing actually for the last year. Um, so first, um, some have argued that prisons serve a dual function of warehousing those surplus to the global economy and creating profits for private prison operators and companies servicing prisons. Um, in this project, I'm not actually focusing on private prisons, not because they're not important. They really are. They make up 8% of the detention centers in the United States. Most of them are immigrant detention centers, um, and those facilities are really horrific expressions of profiteering. Um, the, C the CEO of one of the top um, private prison companies, Corrections Corporation of America, said that um, creating private prisons would be like selling hamburgers. Um, but I think that, there, that focusing on the private prisons obscures the much broader system that creates disposability of particular people and spatializes that disposability through various forms of confinement. And it also conceals the extent to which we are all part of maintaining that system. So by calling the police when we see a character who's suspicious, or by even paying our taxes, income taxes, sales taxes. Um, so when people talk about the prison industrial complex, they're probably talking about that broader system I was just describing. Um, the government and the private interests that use surveillance, policing, and imprisonment to produce profits. But in my project, I'm trying to push that a bit further that we in this room are also interested parties in policing, surveillance, and imprisonment, and that when we produce profits, we're producing social and monetary profits, and also political profits. Um, Angela Davis, one of the people who popularized the prison industrial complex, wrote about how the term prison industry 
can also refer to the production of prisoners, even as the industry produces profits for increasing numbers of corporations. And by siphoning social wealth away from such institutions as schools and hospitals, childcare and housing plays a pivotal role in producing the conditions of poverty that create a perceived need for more prisons. So the part that I'm focusing more on in my research is that part, the, how the term prison industry refers to the production of prisoners. So ultimately what I'm trying to understand in my thesis, um, in my senior thesis for development studies, is that production of incarcerated person. Prisons and jails didn't come out of nowhere. They were put in a very particular, they joined a particular socio-political economic landscape and they serve a particular purpose. Um, and so as an, and as an institution, they have a productive capacity. So I'm interested in looking at how they intend to create particular people and how that relates to the economy and how we are a part of that production process. Um, but more importantly in my project, I think I'm interested in understanding how people respond to that. So I said earlier that the, the system creates disposability and spatializes people based on that disposability. But I also want to know how people re-spatialize themselves, how they reposition themselves, and how they make space for themselves. Um, so that's basically the background, like my, my impetus. Um, my project is still in its formative stages. We just had to write a chapter for our thesis, which was hectic. Um, but I'm learning as I write, like Eve said, I came back with a lot more questions. And in the process of writing, I'm learning a lot more. So I'm not going to try to articulate any answers here. <laughs> um, but I will explain some of the work that I did this summer as part of the CSSJ research cluster. So I went to California. I was in Oakland working with Critical Resistance, which is an anti-prison industrial complex organization. Um, they work on various campaigns. They worked in the past on a campaign, uh, which actually is now the first part of it is launching, the Oakland Power Projects, um, where they are trying to build capacity and power in communities so that they can respond to instances of violence without having to re resort to calling the police. Um, so they just, they had a, a medical cluster that just got trained so that police don't have to be trained for that. Um, they also stopped gang injunctions, but particularly what I was here for was trying to stop San Francisco from building a new jail. Um, I made this zine while I was there, this little, I mean, it's not folded, but I'm just gonna read some information I put on it. This was like a, an organizing tool that we made. Um, but it gives a good understanding of who gets locked up in, in jails in general and prisons in general, but also specifically in San Francisco. Um, in San Francisco, African Americans are 7% of people in the city, but they're 56% of the people in the jails. And evictions, rent increases, foreclosures, and like revitalization process, projects have displaced people, um, made them homeless, or made them otherwise disposable to the state. and um, they're more likely to be incarcerated. They act hand in hand with policing and imprisonment to displace those bodies. Um, one in six trans people has been locked up. One in two black trans people have been locked up. 40% experience sexual abuse while imprisoned. The San Francisco jail population, 75 to 80% have substance abuse issues. 14% have significant mental health issues. Police contact and traumatic and violent confinement make those health challenges worse. Um, over 80% of San Francisco's jail population is pre-trial. That means that they're locked up because they can't afford bail. 25% of those people locked up, of all the people locked up, were homeless before they were imprisoned, and the majority will be homeless when they leave. Meanwhile, San Francisco is proposing a new $290 million jail and that's 6% of the general fund, which comes from income tax, sales tax, it comes from other taxes, um, a couple government receipts. And that's another thing that I do, I'm focusing on the general fund, so I'm looking at all of the people in the room. Um, if you bought something here in Rhode Island, your general money, the, the money will go into the general tax, or I'm sorry, the general fund, which is also being used for the prisons here in Rhode Island, but that's another story. Um, 
And this, the amount that's being proposed for the new jail is more than the housing revenue initiative, the affordable housing revenue initiative that was in the same budget um, by millions of dollars. Um, so this is a really, this is a really informative graphic, I think. It shows how much money is being spent on policing and imprisonment. And on the other side, that so much money is going to these mechanisms of control as opposed to going to mental health care, um, to going to affordable housing, to going to reentry support, to going to al alternative responses to trauma, um, shows to me where priorities lie and also that we are being asked to participate in this, because we fund it. Um, OK. So that's background about California. I spent most of the summer going to legislative hearings, trying to stop them from building the new jail. That's me holding the invest in people, not prison sign. And my friend Jamie, who's also in Students Against Prison Industrial Complex, who went and worked there with me. Um, this was actually a successful time. We had a, there was an alternative to imprisonment hearing and a couple of the supervisors changed their mind about the prison after people testified, homeless folks, um, queer and trans folks who have been imprisoned or are doing anti-prison organizing. Um, that was one, like one success <laughs> in a long, long, long summer. Um, but I guess things thinking going forward, I'm thinking of new ways of imagining labor. So I'm doing a project that involves interviewing formerly incarcerated people and people doing anti-prison industrial complex organizing. I myself have never been incarcerated and I recognize that doing this project demands more labor on their part than it does on mine when it comes to interviewing, when it comes to getting responses. So keeping that in mind, how I'm also part of demanding a particular type of labor from people. And also we can talk more about um, stuff that goes on inside prisons later. Um, I also tried to formulate my project in such a way that I could give back to people as much as I could. So I'm, for, I'm compiling all this data in a graphic novel so that people can decide literally how they're going to be depicted in it. And also they can receive a copy when it's done. And it's not like a 100 page academic text, um, which would also just be too expensive. And then. I'm also thinking about the extent of our complicity with the prison system, financially, but also socially, and thinking about how we benefit from this social production of an incarcerated person as much as the material production of an incarcerated person, and how we replicate those carceral logics every day. Thank you. Thank you, Reem. Um, it's really my honor to be able to contextualize these two wonderful senior thesis projects within what I think are broader trends in human trafficking research. So I'm going to briefly share a bit about my own work, um, drawing from research for my forthcoming book about the anti-trafficking movement in China, Thailand, and the United States, and do my best to weave together these three presentations to explain some of what we're hoping to do through the human trafficking research cluster here at the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice. Loyen was a sex worker in Beijing for over five years. Sex work offered her greater autonomy and a better income relative to typical low wage service sector jobs available to rural to urban migrants like herself. She began working at a massage parlor at the age of 18 after migrating <clears throat> from a rural part of Fujian province in southern China. As an employee, she provided massages in addition to different sexual services and received a monthly salary with commissions based on how many clients she saw. After a disagreement with her manager over owed wages, however, Yen grew frustrated with the job and was recruited to work at China Star, a Christian vocational training and rehabilitation program for sex trafficking victims in Beijing. Her recruitment occurred not through a formal rescue and raid operation, but through weekly volunteer outreach conducted by this American non-governmental organization in Beijing. While Yen and most of her colleagues do not consider themselves victims of sex trafficking, 
the organization that employs them does because they see sex work to be inherently exploitative and thus indistinguishable from human trafficking. And this am definitional ambiguity reflects a primary ideological divide within the global anti-trafficking movement with respect to um, whether or not commercial sex um, is or can be a viable form of work or a choice that somebody can make. So China Star trains former sex workers to make jewelry, which is then sold under the fair trade, ethically sourced, and slave-free labels through the vibrant anti-trafficking movement in the United States. And you may be familiar with some of these products. You may have even purchased some of these products. Employees earn 1,800 renminbi, roughly 295 US dollars per month which is similar to other low-wage jobs in Beijing, where the monthly minimum wage is 265 US dollars. But this is only a third to a fifth of what they formerly earned as sex workers. So they take a significant cut to leave their jobs as sex workers. Meanwhile, the pieces that Loyen designs and produces for this NGO sell for upwards of $70 a piece at anti-trafficking fairs in the United States. Thus, the victim of trafficking label adds tremendous market value to these products, even though it does nothing to raise her wages above the minimum wage. In addition to vocational training, this NGO relies heavily on moral forms of rehabilitation to quote unquote repair the victim. When they begin working at China Star, Yen and her co-workers must contractually agree neither to sell sex nor patronize former entertainment establishments. And this is monitored through closely monitoring their computer use, asking people for their Facebook passwords, and giving discrete incentives for coworkers um, to report on people who break the rules. They're, they're also required to live in mandatory shelter housing, have a nightly curfew, are forbidden from receiving male visitors during the weekdays. At a similar project in Bangkok, Thailand, Workers are not required to live on site. Many hold part-time jobs in other service industries so that they can make enough money to support their family on this minimum wage salary as jewelry makers. They work as waitresses, nannies, cooks, house cleaners in an array of low wage and unprotected positions to make up the difference between their former wages as sex workers and their current jobs as jewelry makers and rehabilitated victims of sex trafficking. These workers choose to remain in their jobs as jewelry makers for a number of reasons. Several have converted to Christianity and enjoy working in a company that vibrantly integrates faith alongside the workday. Of note, in Bangkok, each workday begins with one hour of mandatory church worship. It is literally built into their wages. Others claim significant benefits to working for foreigners in China and Thailand, and these include their social perception amongst family and peers, as well as material benefits, such as weekends and holidays off. These workers, those workers who have not converted to Christianity, the vast majority, generally see minimal differences in the labor relations of their new occupation, but this narrative of transformation and dignified work provides a convenient and satisfying fiction for activists and consumers of jewelry in the United States. So while some sex workers consider such work desirable and the social conditions bearable, the imposed social and moral restrictions cause many to leave these programs. After working as a jewelry maker for three years, Loyan decided to leave the NGO because she saw limited opportunities for upward mobility relative to daily social control over her life. Once Yen returned to her home province in Fujian, she found herself once again facing limited opportunities in the low-wage service sector economy. She attempted to sell the jewelry that she had learned how to make in local marketplaces, but quickly learned that she could not earn a living wage doing so, particularly without the transnational activists brokering and selling the narrative in between. So after three years of vocational training, she was left without a financially viable vocation and once again chose to work in a smattering of low wage occupations, including restaurant work and in a garment factory. Many others who have left these programs have chosen to return to sex work, but it's significant to note that some do, 
but once they do, they must contend with new emotional burdens of having been told that sex work was immoral and needing repair of mandatory life counseling and repentance therapy under vocational training. So my research has found that these forms of rescue and victim rehabilitation promoted by both of these NGOs often contradict the benevolent, their benevolent positions because the labor requirements of such minimum wage work perpetuate the same forms of restriction and coercion that they often associated with sex work. And in practice, such contradictions have significant implications. For instance, both organizations reject applications for migrant workers who are victims of non-sexual forms of labor exploitation. This attends to the fact that one of the fundamental reasons why organizations focus on jewelry making is not because it is a desired local craft or viable vocation, but because it is a trade that is regarded as feminine and feminizing. And as one activist boldly stated to me while selling jewelry at an anti-trafficking conference in Southern California, quote, jewelry making restores femininity to where femininity has been lost. This notion of a rehabilitation industrial complex is one that ties very clearly with Reem's work on the use and profit of labor in prisons throughout the world, where prisoners are paid cents on the hour for their labor. But such labor is regarded as an important part of their rehabilitation and reintegration back into society and often serves to merit credit for reduced sentences. Understanding new varieties of labor exploitation within the global economy cannot happen without equally interrogating how rehabilitation through labor is espoused as a solution to some of the problems of global capitalism or mass incarceration. Another link between human trafficking and the prison industrial complex is that many efforts to rescue victims of sex trafficking around the world have unfortunately led to the increased policing of immigrant sex workers. Uh, my critique on the anti-trafficking movement also draws on what our, our author, Teju Cole, has dubbed the white savior industrial complex, referring to interlocking sources of race, class, and national power that inform contemporary humanitarianism. The additional dialogue of how race and nation function as sources of power within humanitarian efforts is particularly relevant to the anti-trafficking movement, which often relies on racialized claims of Asian women's sexual submission, black and brown women's hyper and errant sexuality, and the corresponding white and global North saviors that need them. And here, Eve's product, project is vital for understanding how legacies of slavery impact modern day anti-trafficking efforts in Brazil and how new forms of abolition may be steeped in problematic racial hierarchies. And in closing, I'm excited to share three main themes for our human trafficking program at the CSSJ. Um, the first would be to understand the links and disconnects between what is now called modern day slavery and historical forms of slavery. The second would be to explore new configurations of labor exploitation in the global economy. And the third, to interrogate sources of power within the anti-trafficking movement or what is now frequently called modern day abolitionism. Our research cluster will bring together faculty across disciplines to work with undergraduate and graduate students to pursue human trafficking research along these themes. We will also host monthly speakers, and in closing, I'll leave up this slide that shows two upcoming talks of interest to the Brown community. So the first is, the title is Deconstructing Trafficking and Enslavement of Children in the Modern Era, Evidenced from Children's Involvement in Artisanal Gold Mining Work in Ghana. And then in November, we have uh, Russell Perenya speaking about uh, eating in Dubai, the labor conditions of migrant, of Filipino migrant domestic workers um, to the Middle East. So on that note, um, thank you so much for taking your time to visit our session today. And I'll open up the rest of the time to moderate some, some Q&A. Thanks. Questions, comments? Yeah. Yeah, could you speak? This has been filmed, so they've asked me to 
ask the people asking questions to speak at the microphone, please. Thank you very much. So you interviewed this young woman who worked at the massage parlor. Yeah. And at that massage parlor, did she have access to things like STI testing and birth control? And were the wages she was promised, in fact, the wages that were given to her? And if all that was true, then from my personal point of view, I, I do think being a sex worker is a viable and reasonable job. But what do you do about the sex workers who are exploited and who aren't given that type of environment? So what's really, really key that I stress about Loyan's um, situation was that she left that job because of a disagreement over wages, which is a fundamental labor disagreement. And it didn't really have too much to do with the sexual parts of the work. It had to do with the fact that labor contracts in general are not maintained you know, in China well. And particularly for sex workers, because it's unregulated and often policed, um, employers are able to get away with a lot less. So I think one strategy to approach this as opposed to trying to abolish all forms of sex work would be to attend to the demands of sex worker rights organizations who have said we should have the ability to organize, um, to unionize if we want to. There should be employer accountability. Our work, you know, our, our, our work environment should be governed under different forms of labor law. But unfortunately, what has actually happened because of quite conservative moral ideas and attitudes towards sex work and the fear that there are always the mo some most victimized people lurking beneath the surface, we have tended to not pay so much attention to sex worker rights at activism and in instead focus more on its overall abolition. Can I ask a yeah. follow-up question? I'm, I'm going to get this wrong, but is it Amnesty International that has recently decided to Yes, to support a policy towards the decriminalization of prostitution. What do you think of that? I think, I mean, that is absolutely something that sex workers around the world have been so excited about, that Amnesty International, a very mainstream global organization, would come out with that statement. Um, and there's been a lot of interesting pushback and discourse in the media because there's a contingent of um, Hollywood. Abolitionists, right. Abolitionist, so an abolitionist organization, CATW, the Coalition Against Trafficking Women, um, absolutely does not support the decriminalization of prostitution. And they recruited all of these Hollywood actresses right. to support them. So like Meryl Streep, Lena Dunham, mm -hmm. all these people signed on to this letter. And sex workers around the world said, what on earth could Lena Dunham possibly know about <laughs> what it's like to be a sex worker um, in Mumbai? And so there's been really interesting like Twitter conversations about <laughs> this, this amnesty issue. And I think it really highlights oftentimes what is this huge divide that we see um, across American media that is intended to like pull at your heartstrings and um, get you to respond really emotionally to what the horrors of sexual slavery look like mm -hmm. without ever listening to what the actual demands of people who are working in sex work are asking for. Um, can I have a last follow-up? Please. <laughs> um, when I was reading about the, you know, the Hollywood sort of horror about what Amnesty International is trying to do, Amnesty put out a I don't know, one page sheet about what decriminalizing prostitution can do, the benefits of it, the benefits in terms of health care, um, not having violent pimps, having it organized. Do you uh, agree with that? Do you think that decriminalizing it does lead to those ben benefits? Absolutely. I think that those benefits exist, but um, what a lot of sex workers, so a lot of trans sex workers and sex workers of color and immigrant sex workers have said, even when you decriminalize it, you're still going to have a stratified kind of workforce where we're still going to be um, vulnerable to, to, to vulnerabilities because of our identities in these ways. So that decrim like decriminalization would just would, would solve problems for a certain category of sex workers, but they would persist for, for many others. So it's not a blanket. But it, it would have positives. Yeah. yeah. Right. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. Thank you. And anyone else? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> 
this is more an observation in support of Reem, your work and what you're doing, but I've uh, spent the last year, I live in Vermont, volunteering in the women's prison, um, going in um, a couple times a month, and it's just so clear to anyone, I'm sure many of you know, that the problem is, as you say, that we need more supports starting from the ground up to keep people out of prison and not ways to put them in prison. I mean, almost exclusively, the women in there come from situations which even the best of us would probably end up doing things we regret, um, and that that money is better spent. So in terms of positive support in everyone's communities to programs that help people who have challenges parenting, who have challenges staying substance free, I just want to say, please support those things. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And opportunities for students. Okay. Um, so, well, also, I didn't mention in my, in, I don't know if I mentioned in the presentation, it's all a blur now, um, but I'm focusing on women's prisons or, women, or incarceration of state identified women. And the reason I make that distinction is that not everyone in a woman's prison is a woman or identifies as a woman. Um, and also that becomes a tricky conversation because in this uh, pull for San Francisco to build a new jail, one of the things that they want more funding for is to build transgender pods. Um, and it's like, it comes from a history of like, the creation of women's prisons was to serve the specific needs of women who would be incarcerated. And now they're gonna make new transgender pods. But I mean, it obscures the fact that prison is no place for anyone to get what they need. So that's just a side comment. But um, I also go into the women's prisons here in Rhode Island with a program called SPACE, um, Space in Prisons for Arts and Creative Expression that Elena read out before. And we facilitate arts workshops um, weekly and basically just hang out and talk and it's a wonderful experience. Um, and I'm also part of Students Against Prison Industrial Complex and we don't go into the prisons. Um, we work with other, we're working with other organizations here in Rhode Island, um, like the newly started Black and Pink, which just decided, just started their campaign to abolish solitary confinement in Rhode Island. Um, so we're gonna offer support for that campaign and solitary confinement is used in a lot of ways to house people who have mental health issues, people who are trans, um, people who are even extremely marginalized within the space of a prison. So those are just like a couple things, a couple ways of supporting people in prison without reinforcing the prison as a viable state of existence. So I think it's important to do work inside of prisons and make sure people are getting services inside, but also not in a way that reifies the state in saying that people should belong in cages. We have about two more minutes. Anybody else? Yes, please, sir. And then, yes, ma'am. Then, yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I am just curious about the human trafficking. Is there any organization that tries to stop this uh, human trafficking? Like, is there any organization that tries to stop this human trafficking, especially? in the northern part of Africa, like in the eastern and northern part of Africa, it is getting worse. People are getting trafficked, and they, at the end of the day, they take their organs. So is this, I mean, is there any organization that tries to stop this kind of uh, thing? I, myself, tries to contact people to help. I'm from Eritrea, which is a country in the, north, in the horn of Africa. A lot of people are dying and being trafficked, at the end of the day, they take their organs. So I'm just curious, is there any research about that thing? 
Yeah, so, there there are many organizations, and I can speak with you about um, like d different directories that you could look to. But one tension that that might exist um, in, in a lot of these places is that there have been organizations that say have been dealing with labor rights for decades, and it's only after the year 2000 when the United Nations passed this Palermo Protocol on Human Trafficking that a category, a new category of human trafficking specific organizations has emerged. So I think many organizations exist. Some are classified exclusively as human trafficking organizations. Others have been doing the work for a long time and may not necessarily have that name. But I would love to speak to you about different organizations working in Can we take this? Yes, and then you. Thank you. Thank you for taking the extra time. I'm always kind of appalled at how little the US looks to places outside of our country for examples. Do you have any notable promising examples of other places or regional areas in the US where an effort has been made to use other kinds of social programs to decrease a prison population? Hmm. Um, so I. Well, I've done, I did research also in Brisbane, Australia, and it's the same, well, it's a very similar trend to the United States, um, where Aboriginal people are like, they make up 2% of the population, but in juvenile detention centers make up 90% of people in the prisons or 70% in adult, in adult facilities. Um, there are, there are places in the United States that have been putting into practice some, some like decriminalization measures. Like California just released Prop 47, Proposition 47, which um, turns some felonies into misdemeanors. But it's also there are some issues with the fact that people are then released from prison without parole or any or not that parole necessarily is a good type of surveillance mechanism, but it meant that they had access to certain programs and certain types of support. Um, I like. I don't know much about other countries that have done um, that are de-escalating their prison populations, but I think it's important to look at. Yeah, uh, working with sex workers in South Asia, one of their concerns was um, second-generation trafficking, where they would prefer to stay in place in their situation, but they didn't want their children being trafficked, and as they fell sick to STDs or HIVs, the brothel owners would look towards their very young children, eight, nine, ten-year-olds, both male and female, to be further trafficked. Um, a lot of work hasn't been done in that because it's kind of a hidden um, activity, but it is a felt need, and I'm wondering whether Brown has an agenda to look at second-generational trafficking. Um, no, I think uh, it absolutely falls under, would fall under the interest in new categories of labor exploitation. I think what's been so confusing about definitional ambiguity in trafficking is that we don't have these categories. And so to have a new distinct category of a type of trafficking based on, you know, generational status or, or being a child and not having access to resources. Um, would absolutely be part of that. And I would just, you know, encourage students who might be interested in taking on that project to, you know, work Only together. Only because when you look at a woman making the decision to go into sex work is fine, but when you get a child who can't make that decision, mm -hmm. then it is beyond, you know, it's. Yeah, and absolutely both the cases of the women that I spoke about in my talk, they both have children who they have left in their hometowns and got migrated to the cities to do sex work. So it looks very different in Beijing and Bangkok. Good yes, morning. sir, go ahead quickly for us. I'm please. from deep south Texas, and one of the things that we've seen through the lack of Im 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 immigration reform that a lot of these sex workers come across the border and they get into a sex slavery type position because of the immigration. What, what, what are your thoughts of, of, of correcting? I mean, I know a lot of people say comprehensive immigration reform, but what specific things have you seen that, that would work in other countries that would try to, to, to prevent those type of uh, workers to be enslaved by uh, not having an immigration to come through across. So every time we increase uh, border control, we strengthen illicit networks for the use of brokers and the use of exploitative intermediaries. So I think uh, different channels for people to actually migrate and work uh, legally, even if temporarily, would decrease some of the most exploitative kinds of border crossings. All right, could I say thank you all very, very much? And thank them. <laughs>